And a lot of the expectations heading into the spring game were, you know, could Texas's defense really step up? And could they actually replace the 12 or so starters that are leaving the program next year? And, you know, what I actually saw from the first string defense in the spring game, and I watched it, you know, very well, like I'm a diehard Texas fan, like watching the spring game from start to finish. uh, I do think that some of the uh, younger kids, I wouldn't call them young ish because like they are like sophomores and juniors a couple of them are like redshirt uh juniors who are now about to to start and even a few seniors who are going to take over this offense heading into next season um or sorry defense um uh, heading into next season, I think that the guys like Charles Amenehu and, um, you know, uh, Gary Johnson and a couple of those, um, you know, CBs and uh, cornerbacks that we're going to lose, like you know, Chris Boyd, I think that a lot of these newer guys are, are going to step up. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's a little bit too premature to really kind of place an emphasis on who's going to be the best Big 12 defense heading into next season. But I do believe that Texas is going to be one of the elite Big 12 defenses, if not the best Big 12 defense. And that's just based on what I saw in the spring game, but the recruiting cycles, and just Todd Orlando looks like a complete defensive coordinator from start to finish. Um, I know that, you know, uh, it's still very early, and we haven't seen how good he's going to be against this new Oklahoma team or some of the new up-and-coming Big 12 teams, but seeing guys like Jeffrey McCulloch and Malcolm Roach, who are now going to be both seniors leading this program next season, um, and seeing how they kind of contain Sam Ellinger and even sacked him a few times in the spring game, um, I think that this this defense is going to surprise the country. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a diehard Texas fan or anything, but I do think that the biggest hole that Texas, or the biggest question marks into this offseason for Texas was the defensive line, and particularly the recruits that are going to you know, take over. Not really recruits, but I guess the guys who are on the bench or redshirting or weren't starters uh, taking over from the guys like Brecken Hager and Charles Amenahu and Gary Johnson and um, you know quite a few of those guys you know, who are graduating. So that's, that's good. But um, on the offensive side, um, Casey Thompson from this from the spring game is looking like a very clear number two quarterback. I think everyone knows that Sam Ellinger is going to be the starter for Texas next year. He did have a great spring game, but I mean, it is spring, spring football and, you know, I mean, it was uh, going up against Todd Orlando's defense, cold, rainy weather. And, you know, I mean, half of the time people weren't keeping score, but all in all, I am very impressed. And one last point I want to make, and I want to just ramble on forever. I do want to hear your thoughts, but um, the wide receiver core at, at Texas is very complete. And I want to say it's it's probably like maybe not the best in the country, but at least probably among the top three or top five in terms of depth and overall kind of balance in the wide receiving attack for Texas next year. And obviously you've probably heard of guys like Colin Johnson and Devin DuVernay, you know, I'm going to be seniors, but um, watch out for guys like Drew McCoy and um, who was the number one athlete, uh, Jordan Whittington, who's now going to be our number two wide, res- or, sorry, wide receiver, but also a running back, number two running back. Um, watch out for the guys like these to really step up and uh, really hustle. Um, but all in all, man, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very satisfied from the spring game. There's obviously Ludacris, who's now playing at the spring game currently as a concert. Um, But, you know, as a huge Texas fan, and, you know, I give you a lot of my analysis and input from Texas. I guess I'm one of your Texas insiders now. But um, I am overall, I would say that, um, especially for the defensive end, as opposed to what um, a lot of people kind of thought or had question marks about um, heading into this offseason. And we don't really know who the, the wide receivers are going to be in terms of the starters, aside from those seniors that I mentioned, like Colin Johnson and Devin DuVernay. John Berg is another name I want to make mention, um, simply because there's just a lot of depth. There's a lot of four- and five-star wide receivers in that attacking unit, and that's really going to be um, really key for guys like Sam Ellinger when they're looking to pass the ball. Um, so, yeah, man, I'm very excited for Texas heading into the offseason. My only concern with Texas 
is you have to tell me who is going to gain yardage running the ball from the running back position. Of course, Ellinger does, but from the running back position, just between the offensive line and the running backs, that has just been severely missing. Yeah, and I just want to bring in a very, very important point on that question is that, you know, a lot of questions for Texas heading into his offseason was who's going to be the number two running back at Texas? Who's going to help out Keonta Ingram, who a lot of people have as, as going to be one of the key Big 12 uh, running backs? I mean, he may not make a Heisman run or anything. I don't have any expectations for that. But I do think that in his tenure in Texas, in the next two, three years, depending on how long he stays, he is going to be the number one running back at Texas, at least until, let's say, we land like a Zachary Evans or a Ken Milton next cycle. The key thing, though, is that our, our number two athlete recruit, I mean, number one, um, sorry, number one five-star athlete in, in the state of Texas, but also number two in the country, Jordan Whittington, he's going to be our number two runner almost guaranteed, not only from what we saw today in spring practice, I mean, spring the spring game, but, I mean, just performing ever since he kind of was given the responsibility of becoming the, the number two running back at Texas. And the thing is, is what I watched from the spring game and, and how he has played in the spring game is that they plan to use him as a combination of a, a running back who's going to get regular, you know, reps but also kind of like a, a wildcat wide receiver. So he's, he's going to be like, you know, the guy who will reduce the burden on Sam Ellinger to run less next year. And just based on what Tom Herman has kind of said in his interviews, because um, I watched the game on Longhorn Network and there's a few interviews on Tom Herman, is that they had him kind of saying that they want, they want Ellinger to run less next year. They want Ellinger to obviously run because that's part of his game, right? He's a running quarterback like Tim Tebow, just run a little less because of the injury concerns, the shoulder concerns, and so on. And so this kid, Jordan Whittington, he was a five-star athlete, uh, you know, recruit from Cuero, Texas. A lot of guys had him playing like wide receiver immediately, but because, as I mentioned, the running back group at Texas, aside from Keontae Ingram, is a little light. Um, to supplement Ingram, I think that you're going to see next season Jordan Whittington having those 10 to 15 reps. And the thing is, the kid is a high schooler, right? I mean, he just came out of high school. He's an early enrollee at Texas. The thing is with him is that he doesn't know what the running back kind of game is. So you're still developing him as a traditional running back. And a lot of people say that um, Whittington um, has the potential to become a superstar running back. I mean, we don't know how good he's going to be because he's never really played a college game yet. But um, people are saying at Texas that he's ahead of Ingram um, from where he was at his freshman year. So high expectations for Whittington to kind of – bridge that gap, that running back gap. And as I mentioned, final point on the running back situation is that um, landing Zachary Evans is huge for Texas in 2020. If you don't land that kid, I mean, you know, the running back room is going to be very light uh, heading into, um, you know, the next few seasons or so um, because Ingram would kind of graduate and kind of, you know, uh, leave after one or two years. Yeah, and we had we had two running backs transfer from Texas this year because they weren't getting enough reps. Um, and and part of the reason is it's just you know it is very competitive. You know, at a school like Texas, I know you're a big Ohio State fan. I mean, any top offensive school is going to be hard to have three or four or even five top, let's say four or five star running backs, simply because you know those guys want to have snaps. They want to actually compete to get an NFL draft stock that's going to be high. If you don't get those snaps, I mean, you're going to transfer to another program. And so that's kind of what happened to Texas this past offseason. It's two guys transferred simply because Keontae Ingram had like a, a record-breaking freshman year for Texas. Um, and he is the lead running back for Texas. And Jordan Whittington will supplement him as a true freshman next year. And we're hoping that Ellinger has to run a little bit less simply because of that shoulder injury that he acquired. I think it was like week five or six against Baylor. So week seven against Baylor last year. So high expectations for Texas in the off season. Um, but more so, more than anything, high expectations for that wide receiver room 
um, simply because of, of not only the incoming class of, of wide receivers, but the previous two or three cycles, as you mentioned, under Tom Herman have been top three recruiting classes according to the 24-7 composite. And in each of those receiving classes, um, Texas has not only been able to acquire the top wide receivers in Texas, but they've also been able to acquire some of the best athletes who are going to be playing wide receiver um, throughout the entire country. So that's going to be um, the key for Texas is how do you utilize that wide receiver room and how are you going to, I guess, elevate the game of the defense um, heading into next season. And the very last point I want to make on this, Mark, is that Texas does have three or four um, five-star defensive players. I know that a lot of people don't consider Texas to be DBU or I mean, some people do. I mean, Texas fans do, obviously, but the entire country doesn't really think of Texas as DBU. But Texas does indeed have, you know, quite a few guys like B.J. Foster, Caden Stearns, Tyler Owens, who are like five-star safeties, who are now developing and grooming under the system. And high expectations are for them heading into next season that, you know, they step up the game and hopefully contain, um, you know, wide receivers in the Big 12 especially from teams like, you know, OU who have several five-star wide receivers. So it's going to be an interesting matchup. I am very bullish on the defense compared to what I previously was. But again, it's just a spring game, and it was kind of in that winter, cold, rainy kind of weather in Austin. Um, you know, who's to say the spring game really had that much kind of impact. And uh, another reason to be bullish on Texas is that Oklahoma may take a bit of a step back. So Jalen Hurts is not the quarterback that Kyler Murray is. The offensive line at Oklahoma has been one of the best, the very best in the nation, right in that top three to five standing over the past few years. Maybe they maintain that. I'm not saying that they're going to be downgraded at offensive line, but it's just a question. Uh, many times offensive lines maintain great play at certain institutions like a Wisconsin for example, because of the process, because of the coaching, uh, offensive line coaching, I believe, is more important than at any unit on the field. You need more cohesion. You meet, need more versatile players because of injuries. They can play different positions along the offensive front because you just won't want to plant a guy, a tackle or guard. And then if they get hurt, bring in the guy from the bench, you want to be able to put the five best players, the best healthy bodies, the five on the field. You don't want to go to like your eighth best player just because he's a guard. And so the coaching and the scheme and the cohesion along the offensive line is very important. And Oklahoma's had that. They've had the talent and the coaching and development and the productivity at the offensive line. And that gets dismissed. People don't think offensive line all the time. They think about the wide receivers and running backs. And, of course, two Heisman winning quarterbacks there. So they're going to take a drop at the quarterback position. Now, Jalen Hurts is really good. He's uh, certainly, though, he's not... Kyler Murray in the run game for as good as he is as a runner, Kyler Murray's like Johnny Manziel faster, uh, but has that kind of juice running the ball. And Kyler Murray's a much better passer than Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts is much better than he was as a freshman or sophomore. He's improved in that category. And certainly uh, Lincoln Riley wouldn't take him in if he didn't think that he could run the offense and run it uh, at peak level or close to it. But I guarantee that Oklahoma's offense isn't going to be as good as it was. Hollywood Brown's gone. Rodney Anderson's gone, even though he was hurt and not much of a factor last year. He had a tremendous season two years ago. And uh, so they've lost quite a bit on offense. And again, Lincoln Riley's system is one of the best in the nation. And they have guys replacing them. But I expect the offense not to be as good. The defense is supposed to be better, but I've got to see it first. Keep hearing that, that Oklahoma's addressed the defense. They fired Stoops and uh, their current defensive situation and bringing in Alex Grinch from Ohio State. Uh, and he did a bang-up job at Washington State, elevating one of the um, worst 25 defenses in college football at the FBS level into a top 25 or 30 defense statistically at Washington State. So we'll see what kind of impact Alex Grinch has. So Texas uh, fans, you may be... Uh, bullish about your team, but you can be a little bit more bullish. Not that Oklahoma is going to drop off considerably. Not That's not what I'm saying, but they may not be quite at peak performance offensively, and we still have to see it defensively.